Before we begin today's episode of Potterless, I just wanted to say that I am proud to announce we've hit two pretty cool milestones since the last episode posted. So the first of which is we passed 100,000 total downloads, which is absolutely ridiculous. That is a crazy thought to me to think that there were 100,000 different instances where human beings were like, yes, I would like to hear this grown man make fun of a children's novel, and I'm willingly going to download this. That's absurd. So thank you guys so much. I really do appreciate it. I, I can't express how strange and how wonderful it is that that's a thing. The second milestone, ooh, voice crack. The second milestone we hit was 50 reviews on iTunes, which is great. So thank you guys so much. It really does help a lot. It makes the podcast show up in a bunch of different search engines if you are highly rated in the Apple Podcast app. And I don't know why it is, but that's just how the world works. So even if you guys don't use that app, I would absolutely love it if you have an iPhone just to open the podcast app in that folder of Apple apps that you never use and just go to the search thing and type Potterless. We're at the point now where if you type P-O-T-T, I think we're like the fifth one down, so we're making progress. (laughs) Just type in Potterless. Go to the page, and if you subscribe to it, you don't even have to use the app. If you just subscribe to it, that'll help. And then if you leave a rating, that double helps. You don't even have to type anything for ratings. You can just write, make it like however many stars you want. I personally think it's a five-star podcast. I'm also painfully biased. But if you guys just took the time to do that in the Apple Podcast apps, if you have an iPhone, that would be great. Also, if you want to be ridiculous, you can load iTunes on your computer and do this too, but I think that is far too much to ask you guys. But anyway, I really do appreciate the 55 or 56 of you that have gone through the process of reviewing it on iTunes. It really does help. helps us show up in search stuff and helps more people find the podcast. So we get to grow our family. We get to grow the team. And, you know, less is more. And it, <laughs> no, God damn it, more is more. I'm just excited to have more people a part of the Potterless team. And it's been fantastic. So thank you guys so much. I really do appreciate it. We also hit 420 followers on Twitter, so life is fantastic. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna delay any further. It's a big week of milestones, but we do need to thank our newest Patreon patrons. So shout out to our newest patron, Cat Kim, as well as Michael Vanderslice, our newest producer level patron. And a correction for last episode, I called Erica and Calvin Bauer, Erica and Calvin Butler, thanks to autocorrect. But Erica and Calvin are also some of our newest producer level patrons. Thank you guys so much, and thank you to the rest of our producer level patrons, Leanne Davis, Andreas Ozelby, and Aaron. Johnson, who never have their shoes come untied, ever. They're always just perfectly tied in place. And finally, a special birthday shout out to our number one fan on Twitter, at the Klaus Sirlopu. I hope I'm pronouncing that properly. She has been the most patient person waiting for this particular episode, because the Yule Ball is her favorite chapter, and we talk about only this chapter for about an hour. So without further ado, let's get into this two-parter episode of Potterless. The first part is the Yule Ball with Rosianne Hals Rojas, who was lovely enough to be in our past two episodes. And the second part, we bring in Vanessa Zoltan of Harry Potter and the Sacred Text, an amazing Harry Potter podcast. So it's going to be a great episode. It's a lot of discussion. And let's get into it. Chapter 23, the Yule Ball. Yes. Canary creams, which are these little treats that the twins made that turn people momentarily into birds, have gotten to the point where all Gryffindors won't accept food from anyone that they haven't gotten themselves because they think it's going to have a canary cream inside of it. With good reason. Of course, with good reason. (laughs) But also, like, Fred and George have to be on cloud a million. Like, they have to be the happiest people in the fucking world. It's gotten to the point where people are so nervous about their stuff that it's just, like, changed Gryffindor culture. It's amazing. (laughs) It's it's brilliant. I just love this... this Mental image of people just spontaneously ter- turning into canaries. It's so great. So, so good. So the Christmas decorations are in and the food is on point. Hogwarts is just going all out for the Christmas stuff. Ron asks Hermione who she's going to the ball with. 
And she says, no, you're going to make fun of me. Malfoy then comes in and says, oh, you've got to be joking, Weasley. No one asked that to the ball. Again, super misogynistic and uncomfortable. Yeah. Really don't enjoy this. Yeah. But then Hermione stands up for herself because she's the best character in the books. She ignores what Malfoy says, but then looks past him and goes, oh, hey, Professor Moody, even though he's not there. And Malfoy like jumps and turns around. It's just, oh, she is so much better of a bully than the school bully. Like, I, love, I love it when she calls him, she says, twitchy little ferret. Exactly. She <laughs> says, she's you're like, a twitchy little ferret. Aren't you like doing a callback to the fact, oh, yeah. comedic genius. She's fantastic. Yeah, like, we know that you're really a coward. Don't you worry uh, about so, it. Yeah. So good. So apparently Hermione has also made her teeth perfect after the Malfoy incident. Yeah. Begging the question of why all wizards don't just do this right away. Yeah. <laughs> she, like when she was... Get someone else to hex them yeah, and then... Exactly. When yeah. Madame Pomfrey's fixing her teeth, basically she's like, let me know when they look normal again. And Hermione's just like, I just kept waiting until they looked perfect. And then I said, yep, they're normal. Yeah, yeah. She just let them go in a little bit longer. <laughs> yeah, she is really, really establishing that she is the greatest character <laughs> because yeah. it's just so good. Like, she's so nice and, like, not selfish at all. But, like, this little thing, she's like, you know what? I could get my teeth fixed and no one yeah. has to know. <laughs> it's so good. Yeah. So, Pigwidgeon is back with a letter. There's a bunch of third-year girls that are like, oh, what a cute little owl. And Ron, rather than use this like a normal person when muscle buff dudes get, like, cute little dogs to try to get girls, yeah. he's like, get away, he's mine. <laughs> like, he brushes all these <laughs> girls aside rather than, like, take the smart approach, which would be to, like, use it as a lure to talk to women. <laughs> Just classic Ron. He's he's so uh, he's so like scathing towards Pigwidgeon as well. Yeah, but I it's don't this get weird it. Mix of like he's he's like possessive and proud of his owl, but he's also really scathing towards it. <laughs> I think after like this trauma of Scabbers, maybe. Yeah, it's yeah. a very similar Scabbers thing where he like loves it, but also is annoyed by everything it does. <laughs> yeah, sure. In the letter from Sirius, he congratulates Harry on the first task. Says I would have done what Crumb did. But I really like your approach better. (laughs) Basically, just the whole letter is just like, good job, stay strong. Like, there's no substance in the letter. It's just like, good work. Stay on your toes. Be vigilant. Which reminds Harry of Moody yelling, constant vigilance all the time. Which I think is great. I feel like that should be one of the quotes. I feel like I see a lot of Harry Potter memorabilia with always or other quotes on it. I feel like constant vigilance needs more... Support. I see it, it pops up every now and then. I think it depends on like current affairs. Okay. <laughs> I think that's what it when I see more of it. But not as much as always, you're right. Yeah, if I was gonna get some sort of Harry Potter thing, I would get constant vigilance or a quote by the twins. Like one of those yeah. two things, I'd have that framed one in my the house. Front, yeah. One in the back. Yeah. Oh, it'd be amazing. A t-shirt. Beautiful. Hermione again insists that Harry try to figure out the clue. Yeah. And then Ron is like, no, nah, it's two months away. Hey, Harry, why don't you play wizard chess? And he's like, good idea. So they play wizard chess <laughs> instead. Uh, then it's Christmas. Harry wakes up to Dobby on top of him. Yeah. And Dobby wants to give him a gift. Harry says that, oh, I also have a gift for you. But he didn't. He just like grabs his oldest pair of socks and is like, you like socks, right? Here you go. Yeah. And Dobby, like, freaks out and loves them, which is adorable. But he thinks that matching socks is a mistake. He's like, oh, they messed up. They give you two of the same sock. Yeah. And then Ron goes along with the joke and is like, yeah, Harry, how did you let him get away with that? So he he gives Dobby a pair of his socks. He's like, now you can mix and match them. And then he gives him his Weasley sweater. He's like, here, I don't want it. Yeah, (laughs) like, can't have all the stuff we don't want. Just take these things we don't need. So Dobby is super happy about it, really excited. And his gift to Harry is homemade socks, which is one red sock with broomsticks and one green sock with snitches on it, which sounds incredible. They sound amazing. That's like some other merch ideas that they should sell. Yeah. How do they not sell those? Socks by Dobby. They really should do that. Yeah. Stance Socks is a sock company that I love, and they have a whole line of Star Wars socks, and they just did a whole line of Disney socks, so I'm hoping that they could do a line of Hogwarts socks, and it would be super cool yeah. if they did these with the one green, one red. That would be fantastic. That'd be great. So then uh, the ball is beginning because it's Christmas. Ron modifies his robes so that they look not as horrible. They still look bad, but they don't have as much lace on them, apparently, which yeah. begs the question of why he doesn't he just like turn it into a suit or something? Like, why doesn't he just like full on make it look good? Why does he I don't he, think like, he's got the skills of... yet. 
Uh, yeah, I guess, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I guess He's got to so. get, he should have asked like, Hermione to give it a go. Yeah, that's true. So they meet up with their dates, who apparently look very pretty. Padma, though, is not psyched about going with Ron, which <laughs> begs the question of why she said yes. The champions are called up. Floor ended up going with Roger Davis, yeah. who is the Ravenclaw Quidditch captain. And I'm taking a bet that after this chapter... Never going to hear about him again. That's just my my guess, is that this is his only instance of existing. But we'll have to see. Harry freaks out because he realizes that Crumb is going with Hermione. What? And not only this, but Hermione looks hot because she's, like, done her hair. <laughs> so yeah. Harry's freaking out. Crouch is not at the table of judges, and Percy is there in his place. He brags to Harry without Harry talking to him or asking him. He's like, I've been promoted. And Harry's like, great, Percy. I don't care. Thanks for the information, Percy. <laughs> yeah, I don't care yeah. at all. He's saying like, now I'm Mr. Crouch's personal assistant. It's like, weren't you already that? But yeah. apparently this is a promotion. He says that Crouch is having a hard time with all the stress of everything and wanted to take a Christmas break, which this makes me kind of suspect and thinks that Bagman did something to Crouch. So now I'm more leaning towards Bagman being the bad guy. Interesting. Crumb is at the table, and he's actually talking a lot, which is the first time that Harry has heard Crumb talk. He's being, like, really cute and just, like, talking to Hermione about stuff, and he starts telling Hermione about Durmstrang. And Karkarov comes over and gets, like, super pissed at him that he's going to, like, give away the secrets (laughs) of Durmstrang, and people are going to know where it's located. And Dumbledore's like, yo, come on. Everyone calm down. This is about international magical cooperation. Exactly. Dumbledore makes some silly joke about finding like an extra part of the bathroom oh, yeah. that he's never seen before, which is like a great chamber reference. Could call back to the Chamber of Secrets and then winks at Harry about it. He makes some joke about like when the Seeker has full bladder. I don't get yeah. the joke, but he winks at Harry after. So I just like the effort that he made a joke to Harry, but I didn't understand what he was getting like, at. Like what the, what the joke was? I thought at first the joke was like referencing the Chamber of Secrets, but then I'm not I'm not so no, sure if it I think is. He, I think he's I think the joke is more like well, it's either like this really cool thing in our school, or it's just something that you see every now and then when you really need to pee. Okay. I think <laughs> I think that's the joke, but I think it's also just to try and make Harry comfortable. But I think Harry uh-huh. is also kind of confused. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Harry's like, he thought Dumbledore winked at him, but he wasn't sure. It's like one of those things where like someone tells a joke and you're like, oh, was I supposed to laugh? Shit, I didn't think it was funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Fleur goes, again, proves to be the worst person in the book, <laughs> criticizes the decoration. She's like, uh, at the Beaubaton, we have the ice sculptures and we don't have, <laughs> we don't have any of these armors and everything is better and the food She's is like, not. She's like, it's so tacky. Yeah, it's like, God, shut yeah. up. Just Shut up. She's the worst. She's the worst. <laughs> Hermione tries to teach Crumb how to pronounce her name. Yeah. Which, which is, is great, great because he first calls her Hermione, which I call yeah. her as a joke, like to remember yeah. how to spell it. And I've said it in the podcast like multiple times. So the fact that, that that's how he's saying it, or at least how that's how the audiobook guy interpreted it. I don't know if it's written that way, but yeah. the audiobook guy made it seem like he was saying Hermione instead of Hermione. And then he keeps getting it wrong like over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> Hermo Nini. Hermo Nini. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I heard once that she put this in this book because so many kids didn't know how to pronounce Hermione because oh, before the films. That um, makes sense. So she kind of like made Crumb do it wrong in all the ways that she'd heard. And then so try to explain, sound it out, which is really funny. It's really that's, great. That's really creative. Um, I also, it also yeah. reminded me of uh, Finding Nemo when Nemo can't say anemone. Oh, yeah. Like, like, Herma, <laughs> Herma Nemini. Yeah. <laughs> So That's so great. then he like keeps getting it wrong, but he's like she's like eh close enough. So then the dance starts. Yeah, Harry's pretty bad at it. Mm-hmm. And once the song stops, he immediately is like, all right, let's go back and sit down. And Pravati's like, wait, I really like this song. And he's like, no, this song's bad. And he just like goes back <laughs> to the table. It's the worst date of all time. So terrible. Just terrible. Ron and and Hermione get into this awful fight. Ron is just being terrible. Oh. He first gets mad at Hermione for going to the dance with Crumb. Yeah. He's like, oh, you're fraternizing with the enemy and she's like what are you talking about this whole thing's about international cooperation like the whole point is to meet other people like what are you talking about and then he's like well crumb doesn't actually like you he's just he's just doing it to you know ask you about harry and then she's like what do you mean like he hasn't asked me a single question oh, about harry so bad he's so nasty yeah ron just keeps trying to like find excuses to discredit yeah. crumb's affection towards her and Hermione's like, no, you're wrong. Like, Crumb told me that the reason he was in the library so much was so that he could, like, try to talk to me. Which, like, makes Crumb 
like really cute, like really adorable yeah, it's very sweet. Victor Crumb. Like this big rowdy uh, yeah. Quidditch player is actually just like really shy and nervous and as nervous mm-hmm. as maybe Hermione and uh, Harry were. As Harry and Ron were, rather, yeah. Exactly. He's just kind of like a little socially awkward kind of dude, even though he's yeah. like one of the most famous people ever. I think it's awesome. I really enjoyed the Crumb character development because I didn't really get that from the movies. And I don't know no. if this is just because... No, it's not in the yeah. films at all. Oh, it's not. Like, he has a lot of bravado in the films, I think. Yeah, because like, in the movie, he's just yeah. like, I'm crumb, I have muscles right. and a buzz cut. <laughs> like, yeah. that was all you really get. Okay, so I really enjoyed the crumb character development. That was a nice little pleasant surprise for me. So then she storms off angrily and is basically saying, it shouldn't have taken you three and a half years to notice that I was here. So she's like completely yeah. justified. Padma then goes up to Ron after this happens and she's like, are you going to ask me to dance at all? And Ron's like, no. <laughs> so then she leaves. <laughs> Yeah, great. good on Padma. <laughs> good on Padma for sure. But also, don't say yes to someone you don't want to go to the dance with. Yeah, she just wanted to go. Uh, I mean, I, at but, least she like took the effort to be like, yo, are you going to dance with me? Otherwise, I'm going to leave. So I, I support right. her for that. At least she like yeah, took she action. Yeah, just storm off. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> or she didn't like ignore him all night. Because I, when I yeah. went to prom senior year, one of... Same situation where, like, one of my friends asked a girl, and she was a couple years younger, and she only said yes, yeah. similar to Ginny, like, because no one was going to ask her. And then she was, like, avoiding him all night because she didn't want to, like, hang out with him. Oh, no. I, like, confronted her. I was like, I get that you wanted yeah, to go to prom. Mean. And I understand, yeah. but, like, this is this guy's prom, and he asked you. You need to respect that and at least spend time with the guy. Like, you don't have to, like, slow dance or grind with him or whatever, but don't just, like, ignore the dude. You are literally only here because of him. <laughs> so... When this came back, I got these like weird flashbacks, but I'm very glad that Padma took the right approach, which was just like, yeah, yo, I'm going to leave if you don't dance. And then Ron's like, I'm not going to. And they just have and like a like, very bye. peaceful like <laughs> later. Yeah, <laughs> it's like very yeah. mutual. So Bagman then comes over and he mentions that he was talking to the twins about helping them market their fake wands because he's got a contact yeah. at Zoinko's, which is killer. So hoping that in the future they become successful gag gift makers. Like, I want that more than anything. Like, more than Voldemort getting defeated, I want the twins to be successful. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I I mean, that's such a good skill. The things that they're making are pretty impressive. Yeah. They're so good. So Ron and Harry go to get drinks, and they hear Karkarov and Snape talking. And Mm -hmm. Karkarov is very worried about something, but you're not sure what. And Snape is like, if you're worried, just leave. So this is a weird thing where clearly she's writing it to try to like make it look like Snape and Karkaroff are being evil. But again, this only makes me further think they didn't do it because Snape is never the bad guy either. So Mm -hmm. it's definitely not them in my mind. But they never really say what it is. But then Snape goes on and he starts like destroying bushes. Yeah. And at first I was like, why the hell is he destroying bushes? (laughs) And he starts like taking 10 points away from anyone that sees him doing this, which I think is great. He's like, 10 points from Ravenclaw. 10 points for Puff Puff, like, leave me to my bush destruction. And you don't know why it is, but then he yeah. destroys a bush, and yeah. it's Fleur and Ravenclaw dude are just, like, making out behind a bush. Yeah. <laughs> so you get the Which, idea like, that all of these kids have just been hiding in the bushes, making out with people. <laughs> uh, yeah. Wait, so was, was it a lot of people in the bushes making out? Yeah. Or, oh, that's, okay. I must have misread that, because I thought he was destroying bushes, and then these people saw just him. Just out of rage. Yeah, I thought he was, like, destroying them out of rage, and no, then he came no, no, upon no. floor. Oh, no, so everyone that he's trying to hiding in a bunch is, of bushes. Everyone was just oh, making out of these bushes. Yeah. Okay, I must have yeah. misheard this from Audiobook that's Man. That's so funny. Also, shout out to uh, Ravenclaw, dude, because now not only he gets to brag about going to the dance with apparently the hottest girl in the world, but made out with her, yeah. and now, like, everyone's going to know because people are going to find out about this, so it's like... I mean, Roger Davies is also, like, kind of a catch, too, so... But, no, uh, Was he it, hot but... in the movies? Was he, like, Neville Longbottom hot in the movies? Or, sorry, seventh movie Neville Longbottom hot in the movies? <laughs> um, in the movies, I don't think... I don't think we ever see him more if we see him as in the background, but in the books, he's described okay. as, like, a, you know... Good-looking he's dude. A handsome, he's a handsome man. Well, yeah, he's yeah. on the Quidditch team, and only attractive, important people play Quidditch. Yeah, Quidditch yeah. captain, Ravenclaw. Oh, he's a hot yeah. nerd that's good at Quidditch. Yeah. The trifecta. trifecta. Good at sports, books, and looks. <laughs> He's a, yeah, he is a catch. Wow. Shout to him. Yeah. So good job, Fleur. <laughs> so so that goes down. And then after this, Ron and Harry overhear Madame Maxime and Hagrid mm. talking. And Hagrid's like opening up to Madame Maxime and yeah. she's like really confused. And then you learn that Hagrid is admitting to Madame Maxime that he is a half giant and that he also thinks Madame Maxime is a half giant. And yeah. she gets super offended 
she's like, oh, I just have big bones. Yeah. Based on the descriptions of the book so far, she seems like comically large because Hagrid is comically large, not tall. He is stupid big. And she gets super pissed and like storms off. And then Harry and Ron are like, whoa, Hagrid's a half giant? And then it takes multiple pages where they're like freaking out about this. Is there a reason why him being a half giant is a big deal? Well, Are so giants it's, frowned it's, upon in the wizarding it's, world? It's, th- that's the interesting thing about the back and forth to me is that like Harry's like, whoa, whatever. And Ron's like, did Hagrid ever tell you that he was a half giant? And you suddenly get the idea that like Ron is, I don't know, there's like some prejudice kind of thing in Ron that makes him think like this is sort of an indicator of something else. But Harry being new to it, like doesn't really know. And he's like, what? It's Hagrid. Like whatever. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, it would, yeah. Whole, it's, weird, it's weird because you're just a bit like, oh, oh, like something else is happening here. Yeah. I don't, it's, it's weird. I don't get why in the wizarding world, some of the like non-normal people are viewed as so bad. Mm. When Lupin was a werewolf and everyone was just like, oh, we can't be taught by a werewolf. Yeah. If he's got it under control, who cares? Clearly Hagrid's not doing any harm. Yeah. Who cares? I mean, like it's that whole like blood purity thing. Is that like yeah, weird? it's creepy. Yeah, which is weird, and it was that reminds me a lot of like interracial marriage laws and things like that. Like, yeah, it was yeah. a little. I I was put off by it, but I was glad, like you're saying, I was glad that Harry was like, "Yo, why do we care?" Yeah, who cares? But the, Ron being insistent about it was strange. I didn't yeah. really understand that. So then, after this, Harry bumps into Cedric, and Cedric yeah. is like, "Hey, you should probably take the egg and go in a bath." And yeah. open it underwater. And Harry's and, like, yeah. what? Bring the egg with you. Wink, wink. Yeah, he's like, go to the prefect's bathroom, yeah. run a bath, go underwater, and open the egg. And Harry's like, okay. Which, to me, really begs the question, like, how the hell did Cedric figure this out? Yeah. I'm really hoping it was, like, this accidental situation where he was, like, washing dishes or something, and he, like, dropped it in the sink, and it yeah. opened and then started not just screaming or whatever. <laughs> Like, I'm really, I really wish they would have explained how that happened. And the fact that Harry didn't ask him, like, wait, how'd you figure this out? Right. Bothered me so much. Because in what world are you just like, okay. Like, no, you're going to be like, wait, hold on, Cedric. This is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. How did you come up with this? Well, I think, I, th- I think you won't be disappointed. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm excited to see. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, it's so hard to know. I'm, like, glad, the, I'm glad you're doing, you're not giving me any spoilers because there will, yeah. my girlfriend especially, but other people listening, like if someone ever hints at anything in an episode of the podcast, people are like, oh my God, I can't believe somebody like said something. And most of them have like gone over my head where I like haven't, yeah. like nothing, no recording of a podcast episode has ruined any spoilers for me yet. Yeah. But like I've had people text me and they'll be like, I can't believe so-and-so like said this, like that, uh, did that you know? Notice there was a spoiler. Yeah. Yeah. So, but so they. I'm glad that you're doing. You're very much on top of like not telling me anything. I very much appreciate. Yeah. But it's it's really interesting to hear it. It like yeah. (laughs) It's It's like a full grown human that has not (laughs) read the books. The only person. uh, I'm just. Well, no, but more more in the sense of like just like not knowing what's important because I kind of take that for granted now when I reread them. But I I know what's going to happen. Yeah. I can't really remember what it was like. I have to take note of anything strange. Like anything strange could be important. Like when it was like Cedric went down a different stairway. I was like, what's in the stairway? Who's there? What's going on? (laughs) And then it it just turns out to be the kitchen. But I was like freaking out. I was like, what is in it? But it's just (laughs) the kitchen. Like it's not important at all. So then Harry goes back to the Gryffindor common room after this. Yeah. And he finds Ron and Hermione like in this big heated fight, continuing yeah. this this terrible argument that they've had before. And basically it ends with Hermione just shouting like, next time there's a ball, ask me before someone else does and not as a last resort, which then sort of reveals that Hermione probably likes Ron yeah. and really wanted Ron to ask her and like only said yes to Crumb because Crumb asked her and like took the effort. So at first, like you kind of just get this weird thing where it was like the Hermione's our friend, we should go with our friend kind of thing. But this introduces a whole maybe they like each other thing, which later you learn. Well, because that's what's interesting for me because this to me showed me more that Ron liked her. Yes. Not necessarily immediately that she liked Ron. Okay. Because, like, I mean, I kind of got the impression that she likes Ron, but it's more like she's hitting the nail on the head. Like, you're really upset, not because of me going with Crumb because it's fraternizing with the enemy. It's because 
I'm not going with you and you like me. Yeah. But then, yeah, it definitely adds that new dynamic into the friendship that's like, yes, oh, which makes shit. it a little weird. Yeah. And then Harry, yeah. the, and the Harry's like, that, what? Yeah, it ends with, it's like, Harry didn't say anything. He liked being back on speaking term with Ron too much to speak his mind. So he's like, I enjoy being Ron's friend too much to, like, tell him that he's being dumb about this. Yeah. But he thinks that Hermione is right in this situation and Ron is wrong. But he he enjoys being Ron's friend so much that he's like, I don't want to say anything. Just, yeah, he's <laughs> so like, he's just I'm just going to touch this right now. He's just going to wait. And then that's the end of the chapter, which is great. Yeah. And that's going to be the end of this episode. So a fun little oh, way man. to end it what with Harry few, just being like... A few chapters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So these were an incredibly dense set of chapters. And I'm yeah. really enjoying it. I'm excited to see what happens next in the book. Um, but... This was super solid. I really enjoyed, like, I thought the beginning of this book was meh, and then it slowly got better, but, like, these middle, like, seven chapters yeah. were solid. A lot of they things happened. so much packed into them. Yeah, really a lot packed, and a ton of character development, like, from everyone, which was yeah. really nice. So, definitely really enjoyed it there. But that that's where we're going to cut it. Um, Rosiana, thank you so much for being on another episode of Potterless. This was... Super fun. Thanks for having really me. Really glad to have you a part yeah, of it. Yeah, it was great. It's fun to revisit with someone yeah, who hasn't I'm read glad that, uh, I'm glad that you could get enjoyment out of it as well. I appreciate all of the <laughs> all of the extra information you brought in, your British perspective, and knowing things about J.K. Rowling that I had no idea. So it's been Thanks. super fun. <laughs> but yeah, good luck with all of your social media endeavors. I know you're doing Vlogmas right now because it's December oh, yeah. when we're recording this, and crazy. that just sounds... That sounds so stressful. I can't imagine making a video every day for a month. I struggle to make a video a it's week. It's hard, but it's fun, so, you know. Yeah, as long yeah. as you're enjoying it. Power to you. <laughs> mostly, mostly. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so Twitter for Rosiana is at Paper Time Lady, and then YouTube is just youtube.com slash Rosiana with two N's, yes. right? Yeah, the two ends, yeah. Cool. All righty. Well, thank you again so much for joining. And listeners, thank you so much for listening. Uh, you can follow us along on iTunes and SoundCloud. If you want to rate us on any of those or tell any of your friends about us, that would make you the coolest person ever. And until next time, as they say in Hogwarts all the time, wizard on. <laughs> And thus ends the first part of this episode, but let's get right into the second part where we further discuss the Yule Ball with Vanessa Zoltan of Harry Potter and the Sacred Text. Hello, Internet, and welcome to a special side talk extra chapter discussion episode edition of Potterless. I'm here with a lovely guest, Vanessa Zoltan, who is the co-host of Harry Potter and the Sacred Text. She's a lovely human being that I had the fortune to meet up with in person for their live show during the tour. And she's here to discuss more thoroughly chapter 23, the Yule Ball, because it's a monumental chapter. Vanessa, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm excited to talk about this meaty, high school, angsty chapter in Harry Potter's life. Yeah, it's like prom, right? It basically is. Yeah. It, I mean, it's got all the classic drama of prom. There's drama of like, who do I go with? Yeah. There's people hooking up. There's some weird chaperone stuff going on. I feel like it has all the elements of prom. There's also like disappointment about like not getting to go with the person who you actually want to go with. Oh, yeah. It would be great if there was a scene where like the parents could show up and take pictures. Molly wow. Weasley would ask for a million photos on the staircase yeah. and she would probably yell at Ron for not putting the boutonniere on right and all the yeah. other stuff like that. She would be a great prom mom. I agree. So that's the one missed opportunity. But other than that, it's a great chapter. <laughs> How was your prom experience? Because mine was horrible. I went to one prom and it was atrocious. I didn't go to prom. I oh, okay. Was, so it was better I, than most probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wore all black in high school and had pink okay, hair nice. and like pretended that I was too cool for the prom. And so my best friend who went to a different high school was playing oboe for her school's production of Fiddler on the Roof. That is awesome. And the night of my prom, I went and saw that. That is so much better than going to prom. That is way better. It was it? I, I mean, know. my prom experience was horrible. Oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was I was basically going to prom with the girl I was dating in high school at the time, uh -huh. but she had already decided that she was going to break up with me, but she didn't want to be mean and do it right before prom. Like, it would somehow be better if we went to prom and I was wondering what was wrong the whole night. And then the next day she was like, oh, yeah, I think we should break up. It was, it was garbage. <laughs> uh, it was 
well intended. I guess she was like trying to be nice, but it, it didn't end up working out. But it's all good. One of my buddies, the same thing happened to him. So, and we like got ready and stuff together. So the best part of prom was like getting dressed. And then it <laughs> went all downhill. I feel like that's probably true for a lot of things. Mm-hmm. The best part is the before the thing. Yeah. So much of a wedding fun is like planning with your family mm-hmm. and, you know, like doing all of the before things. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. But we have the prom here and there's there's a, b- a bountiful harvest of stuff that goes down at the Yule Ball. Yes. So let's just get into some of the stuff. I guess the first thing that really stood out to me was Harry being so surprised that Hermione looks attractive for prom. <laughs> He's like, what? Um, this is impossible. <laughs> so in Harry's defense, I feel like hair straightening. So I have very curly hair. Okay. And I got it straightened a few years ago um, mm-hmm. for like this dumb thing. And one of my best friends, Rebecca, walked right by me. And I had to grab her wrist. Oh, wow. She was like, oh, my God. So I think that when you use identifiers to, like, signal seeing someone, Mm -hmm. right, like, that gets complicated. And the other thing I will say is that this is the chapter where you find out Hermione's badass move of having her teeth shortened. I love that she did this. So good. I do too. Coming from Hermione, who's like such a goody goody two shoes, like she starts to break the rules more as this book goes on. And she did it a little bit towards the end of Azkaban. But I like that that her first like big move into being a bad girl is like, I'm going to make my teeth look better. (laughs) Like that's her stepping out and rebelling. I just understand why Harry didn't recognize her. She's like basically had plastic surgery. I mean, like, not really, but. (laughs) She's amended her looks. True. I don't know. I, I'm like sort of team Harry. He's like not used to seeing her in blue. Okay, yeah. Her hair looks totally different. Her smile looks totally different. We are, the way we are introduced to the way Hermione looks is that she has bushy hair and big teeth. Mm-hmm. And like she's changed both those things. I guess like my image of it is skewed because it was she was always played by Emma Watson in the movies. And I guess the difference between pre-ball and at the ball, Emma Watson was, like, not significant. This is kind of one of those things where I wish I had read the books, like, without seeing any sort of movie or whatever. And I always prefer this with books is, like, I like making the character in my head rather than, like, knowing who the actor is. Absolutely. And I feel like I would have had a better, like, this would have been more significant for me if I didn't know, like, oh, it's Emma Watson with slightly different hair. It's like, no, this is a girl with, like you're saying, her defining characteristic is her big hair and her big teeth because it's literally the only two traits they really talk about her in these first four books is that she's got big hair and big teeth and is a nerd. Like, they don't really describe how she looks any other way. Yeah, I I feel strongly... I'm a little bit defensive of Harry in this moment. (laughs) Yeah, it makes sense. The one thing I I don't get with the the teeth thing is, like, especially if her parents are dentists, Mm -hmm. why didn't she do this earlier? Or, like, why don't all wizards just automatically, like, rather than get braces or something. Why isn't every wizard just like, oh, make my teeth perfect spell? Is that, like, not a thing in the wizarding world? it seems as though most wizards do have perfect teeth because she says, my parents are dentists and they don't believe that, like, I should magically do it. They wanted me to do braces, Mm -hmm. right? So I feel like maybe we don't find out about a lot of other wizards' teeth, do we? They always mention Hermione's teeth being big, but they're never... There's never a further comment of people having crooked teeth or anything like that. The only other thing that was similar was they mentioned that one girl, when Hermione's trying to tell Ron like who she should ask to the ball, there's that one girl that they mentioned that used to have really bad acne but doesn't anymore. And that raises the same question for me. is like, if I was a wizard and I had acne, I would immediately use a get rid of my acne spell. It'd be like the first thing I did. But like not everybody's a good enough witch or wizard, right? So I you guess. Like have to make an appointment with like Madame Pomfrey. <laughs> like a wizard dermatologist. Yeah. I think so. <laughs> I mean, like you don't want to do a bad job, right? True. There's definitely like wrong ways to do healing magic, uh-huh. which Delroy Lockhart teaches us about in book two. So like you don't want to be like trying to clear your own acne and then like giving yourself like huge scars instead yeah right so true true don't question the wizarding world <laughs> okay. just kidding i won't I'll, i won't ever <laughs> speaking of of the wizarding world the next thing that i found super interesting in this chapter is that they have the weird sisters doing the music for it and they haven't really talked about the weird sisters that much 
in the book, but from the description, it makes it seem like this is a really famous group. And I'm, I'm wondering, I don't know, I don't know if you know it, like how, like to put in perspective, like how big of a, of a thing is this to be like, oh my God, the weird sisters are playing it. Like, would that be like, oh yeah, like Bruno Mars is playing prom. Like how big is the weird sisters? Do they ever get into that later in the series? I don't think, no, they don't. Okay. My gut would be that it's not Bruno Mars, <laughs> that it's like... It's not Taylor Swift It's level. like a super cool local band. Okay. I think we also have to remember that, like, yes, this is, like, quote-unquote just the prom, but it's also, like, it's the first Yule Ball in, like, a hundred years. Yeah, right? it's a big deal. Like, maybe they're doing it for the press coverage, right? They're going to be, like, written about in the Daily Prophet as having, like, done the Yule Ball at Hogwarts. Top government officials are there. True. Hogwarts probably pays well, you know? <laughs> I would hope so, since so much shit happens. Yeah. Like, maybe they're just in it for the galleon. Yeah. I mean, if I was going to perform there, I'd be like, look, you guys are going to have to pay me a million dollars. Voldemort attacks this school every year just around finals time. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. But it's not finals time. It's Christmas time. That's true. They, so nothing bad will I know. happen. They should look. <laughs> no, I feel like they're fine, right? Voldemort doesn't attack till April. <laughs> yeah. Totally he's, he's on a strict schedule where he waits until... Yeah. <laughs> right when finals are about to heat up, yeah. then he's like, oh, they're stressed out with school. <laughs> the next big thing is uh, is Ron having the classic. I feel like this is where we really learn that Ron has a crush on Hermione because he does the classic like. I think we see signs of it in book three. That oh, that okay. Is, I'm, I'm a minority in that opinion. Okay. So. Well, what is your thought on, on when it's revealed in book three? So he's obsessed with the fact that he can't understand Hermione's schedule in book three. Oh, right. In a way that I think is like Harry is not obsessed with it. And I think no. that if you're just a friend, you're like, I don't understand what's going on with her, but you move on. Sure. But I think that because he's romantically interested in her, he feels, like, entitled to that information. Oh, so, he's, like, but concerned. Yes, this is, like, he wants to know what she's doing. Yeah. He's, like, what the hell is going on with you in okay. book three? But yeah. I agree with you that this chapter, I, it's certainly the first time that, like, Hermione articulates something about it at the end, and then Harry, like, Harry's in a monologue, says, like, he thinks that Hermione has the right idea that Ron is actually upset that he didn't get to go to the ball with Hermione. Yeah, because he does the classic, like, get mad at Crumb for no good reason. And the thing is, like, at the end of the day, no pun intended, but pun intended, Ron and Harry really dropped the ball on this one because they could have asked the people that they wanted to go with way earlier, but Harry waited until the last minute, and then Ron, the only person he asked was Fleur because she, like, accidentally used the Vila charm on him. Classic middle school boys. Yeah, I know. I mean, <laughs> it kills me. It's not in this chapter, but the way that Ron asks Hermione when he's uh, like, hey, you're a girl, sort of. Heartbreaking. I'm so glad Hermione took it, such offense to that because you're right. It's it's horrible. Like, it is so bad the way he did it. And I'm glad that she got upset and sad and, and all kind of stuff like that. Because, yeah, when I read that, I was like, oh, my God, Ron, no. <laughs> yeah. But, and then in this chapter, though, they get into, like, a screaming mm-hmm. fight in the common room. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. I I feel like that's not very Hermione-ish. I can just imagine that she's, like, exhausted. She's, like, emotionally spent from, like, spending the day with Crumb and, like, getting dressed and, like, really being in love with Ron. But they are, like... They are screaming at each other in the common room. I just, I can't think of a lot of times where Hermione, like, makes a scene. But yeah, whenever she, she does, it seems to be about Ron, right? Yeah, and that's what I was going to say is, like, I feel like the only time she gets super upset, or at least that I've seen thus far, is when Ron is involved. So I think it it does go to show. When she got so mad at him in the common room, that's in this chapter when I learned, like, oh, Hermione likes Ron, too. Like, and it's confirmed. Because with Ron, it comes very apparent when Ron's, like, super mad at Crumb, like, clearly regretting that he didn't ask her. And then Hermione's super mad because she's... it's She's basically, like, I wanted Ron to ask me, but also, you know, I'm not going to, like, put up with him being mean to me and being mean to Crumb for no reason because Crumb's also a really nice guy. So it's out of character for her to get so upset but I think it is because she has such strong feelings for Ron and she wishes that the whole situation was handled differently because it had the potential to be great and it just kind of ended up being, like, less than ideal for all parties involved. Yeah. Oh, poor Hermione. Poor Hermione, it indeed. It sucks to have a crush in high school. 
Uh, boys are so stupid. Th- oh, it the stupidest. It sucks to have a crush on a boy ever because boys are so stupid. Yeah, the boys are horrible. And especially Ron and Harry because yeah. the other thing you got to think is like she spent up until a couple chapters ago, she spent the whole book like trying to get Ron and Harry back together and not hating at each other. So she's stressed out from trying to get her two best friends to drop the stupidest argument ever and be nice to each other. Yeah. And she's dealing with... Uh, like being at the ball with Crumb, who is older than her, really famous, and is one of the champions. So she has to do the dance and like be put in the spotlight. And she's just this like quiet, what is she like, thirteen year old girl that like doesn't have any sort of spotlight. And now she's thrown into all of this. So Hermione is dealing with so much stuff that if she has one little outburst at Ron for being an idiot, like totally defensible because she's going through so oh, much. Oh yeah, <laughs> no, she's like basically flawless. I mm. think. I I mean the other moment great Hermione moment in this scene is when she messes with Draco. Oh, um, yes. Draco makes... Draco full-on calls her a racial slur again. Yep. He mm-hmm. calls her a mudblood. And she's just like, oh, hi, Professor Moody. And then calls Draco a ferret. I mean, mm-hmm. I love it. Oh, she's it's great. She's just full-on, like, don't mess with her. I've, I've mentioned this in earlier episodes, but, like, she's a better bully than the school bully. Wait till the end of this book with what she does to Rita Skeeter. Oh, yeah. I So I have finished the book now. Okay. I'm, I just started book five. Uh, I'm, like, maybe five or six chapters in. So, yeah, what she does to Rita at the end, absolutely phenomenal. So good. She's, like, sort of a terrible human being. It's, <laughs> it's a little terrifying because she does basically – capture and blackmail a grown woman. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, like, won't let her out of a jar. But at least I she, mean, like, put a stick in the jar and poked holes in it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. I, but can you imagine being stuck in a jar? No, not know. at all. I, like, feel for Rita. Yeah, this is, like, Hermione is letting her, like... I feel like book four might be... Book four and five is where she gets the most vicious... Okay. And then she slows down a little in six and seven. I'm not sure I mean that. But four and five, she's like full on warrior. Yeah, it's awesome. four for I sure. It. I just and wanted to light her hair on fire. Oh, no, I love it. I will defend to the, the day I die that Hermione's easily the best person in the book. The book should have been written about her from her perspective for her. Like, if they did a revamp of the series and it was all from Hermione's perspective. I would love it. She's great. And I love that she finally becomes, like you're saying, a little vicious in the fourth book because there's always some sort of justification. Like, yes, the Rita Skeeter thing is a little mean, but Rita Skeeter was ruining her and her friends' lives. And yes, like her maybe yelling at Ron isn't the nicest, but like Ron treated her like crap. So I think she's always justified. And I'm glad that she's kind of coming out of the shell to being vicious. I'm excited to see if she does it in book five because I love powerful Hermione. It's great. Well, just wait. She oh. goes to a poor unsuspecting girl. Good. I'm excited. But I don't know if I would say that it's justified. I would say it's provoked. Okay. Yeah. That, like, that is a better word for it. It's never for no reason. Yes. But like also how cute is Hermione on a date? I feel like we really see her loyalty in this moment too. Like the same way that when she adopted Crookshanks, she was like, he's ugly, but I love him. She's like on a date with Victor and she's, like, not about to treat Victor like crap just because she likes Ron or, like, yes. Ron was late, right? Like, she's sitting there and she's being, like, a really attentive date. And even though she doesn't have feelings for him, she's being very present and, like, trying to teach him how to say her name. I was going to say, even though he can't pronounce her name, she's being very patient. <laughs> yeah. it's My dad can't always pronounce my name, so I feel for her. Oh, oh. Can we talk for a second, though, about Percy? Oh, and how he's the worst ever? Yes. <laughs> Percy's the real villain of the books, let's be honest. Like, if you have to rank all the worst people, like, Percy's below Voldemort for me. At least Voldemort, like, throws in a sick pun every now and then. Like, Percy's way worse. <laughs> uh, I, I do not feel comfortable with that. <laughs> I, I mostly At all. <laughs> I'm not serious. I know. But, like, no, Percy... I don't know. I, like, work with students. Percy's 18, 19. This Mm -hmm. is, like, his first job out of college. I mean, not out of college. Like, out of, you know, his OWLs and Uh NEWTs. And he's, you know, like, he's trying. I mean, he's, like, doing a bad job. But he's trying to, like, figure out who he is. Uh And his older brothers are super cool. They are. Like, Bill. and, And so, like... 
he's the nerd. I feel like he's just trying to, like, separate himself from his family. I don't know. I feel for Percy. I don't like him. I wouldn't mm-hmm. want to have dinner with him. But <laughs> I I think he's justifiable. I just think it's hilarious how defensive he is of Mr. Crouch. Given Yes. We see that he's just, like, willing to be blindly loyal. Because mm-hmm. it seems like him and Crouch, like, have never really spent any time together. He started this job. And then Crouch immediately has this incident at the World Cup and, yep. like, quote-unquote, falls ill. And he is just, like, spinning the company line on this. It's, I don't know. I would want him to be my assistant. He is, like, very protective. I do. I would love a sort of spinoff to see how Crouch was acting under the influence of Voldemort and what Percy blindly just, like, let pass. Oh, yeah. He would go full Like, what on. kind of weird stuff goes down? I'm, I'm imagining, like, the guy from Men in Black trying to be a human, like, that bad level of, of acting and Percy just being like, yep, everything's great. I think Percy is supposed to be throughout the book sort of, like, the good guy who becomes the Nazi mm-hmm. without, like, realizing that that's what he's done. He's just, like, following orders and following orders. Yeah. And loves that he's being promoted and we see how dangerous that can be that you're not willing to question authority in that way and I think because we love the Weasleys so much we by extension are like concerned about Percy and that's the journey that we follow Percy on and he's definitely in that like Rolf from Sound of Music moment in this scene yeah where he's like starting to just you know believe whatever is being told to him yeah i never thought of it that way but that is good and it it does teach you i guess it does really teach you a good lesson and you start to learn it i like very recently read the chapter in five where you find out from arthur what exactly percy did in terms of like basically abandoning and disowning his family because they don't support what fudge is doing even though fudge is clearly corrupt and not level-headed so yeah it does teach a good lesson of like sometimes even if things are going well for you and everything seems okay like sometimes you got to take a step back and be like is this right am i doing the right thing am i being a good person percy just has like faith in the system yeah i feel like it gets him into a lot of trouble but he isn't willing to question that faith definitely oh i was gonna just also bring up how um what a crappy date ron and harry are to oh their the worst dates. that's so rude i feel like it's worse than your prom experience like they just like full stop abandon their dates yeah and there's a lot of making fun of i always say her name wrong of parvati for yes. like leading in dancing and it's like what is she supposed to do harry's like not taking any initiative he like forgets that you know, he is going to have to do a big dance in front of everyone. She's, mm-hmm. like, helping him out. And it's just For written sure. in this, like, super anti-feminist, like, uh, what a drag. She's, like, leading him in dancing. It's like yeah. she is saving him from looking like a complete idiot. Yeah, she really does. Like, when it was written in the book, and I don't know if this is just because it's from Harry's perspective or what, but it seems like it's trying to paint her as being, like, a show-off. And she's, like, attention-seeking and all this kind of stuff. But, like, first off, Harry asked her. It's not like she was one of the girls that threw herself at Harry asking him um, when he was set right. on asking Cho. So it's not like she was trying to do this or whatever. And you're, you're 100% right that they're in the middle of the dance floor in front of everyone from three schools right. and the government and teachers and all these other people around. And Harry didn't take the time to learn how to dance or remember to dance. So she's like, look... I'm going to take control of the situation and try to make you not look like an idiot. So I'm going to lead, which is totally what you should do in that situation. I fully support her. And when she even, like, when the boy from Bobatons comes up and asks her to dance, she, like, is sweet and, like, asks Harry's permission. She's Mm -hmm. like, would this be rude of me? And Harry says, no, go ahead. I just think she's a perfect date. She does do really well. And it's another thing I feel like in the movie that wasn't done super well because... I'm pretty sure in the movie, her and Padma kind of go up to Harry and Ron and very sassily are like, are you guys even going to dance with us? Like, angrily. And in the book, it was very sweet. It was like, is this okay if I do this? Are you just going to sit here the whole time? And Harry's like, yes, I am. I'm the worst human. And she was like, all right, cool. I'm going to go hang out with this dude. And and it was much more polite than I think it came across in the film. They made it seem like she was upset with the situation where it seemed like she was trying to do her best and keep a good face throughout the whole evening and Harry was just being an awful Yeah, date. and like have fun at her prom. Like again, 
the Yule Ball is like every hundred years. Mm -hmm. It's not like she's going to get to go to another one. And she's like, screw you. I'm still going to have fun. Yeah, which is completely valid. Just because Harry's being crappy doesn't mean that she has to be equally crappy or let him bring her day down. Like, it's an awesome event. You should have a great time and not sit off the side in wizard angst like Harry does. He approaches it wrong. She approaches it right. This is also a chapter where we see Dobby for the first time in a while. Ugh. Which, I know everyone loves Dobby, but I've not gotten to the point in the series where he becomes good yet, so I'm still very yeah, much yeah, yeah. on... No, he's super annoying. I'm very anti-Dobby at the moment. I don't like people that talk in third person. I don't like people that try to break Harry's arm. Uh, so, so far not feeling Dobby, but everyone freaking loves him. So either in book five, six or seven, he's got to do something dope. So, I mean, Dobby <laughs> becomes a more lovable character in my opinion, but I totally see your point. I think he's super annoying. Yeah. I mean, like, I don't want to kill Harry Potter, just maim. Like, stay <laughs> out of my business. This is not someone who I would want in my life. Yeah. But he does come through in a pretty big way and you, you just got to love him. Mm -hmm. He's like a loyal part of the team. That's true. I mean, he does very much help Harry out with the Gillyweed situation. Yes. Which is clutch. Harry would have died or not even been able to get in the water at all <laughs> without that. Bobby is just like a sign that like, even if one of your team members is annoying, it's just like good to have people on your team. Yeah, that's true. Like, like even if you're sort of like, really, you're <laughs> on my team. Just like there's safety in numbers and it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. And anyone can contribute even if they surprise you like the tiny little annoying Dobby that he is. <laughs> but he comes through. He does come through. And like all he wants is like socks. He's yeah. like sort of an easy friend in a lot of ways. He's so sweet. Yeah, he's one of those friends that's like really easy to get gifts for. It's like, oh, just get him socks. He'll love it. <laughs> yeah. And then I guess the the final like real big thing that goes down towards the end is is the whole like Hagrid Maxime giant giantess thing and and it being taboo and I just felt I felt so bad for Hagrid with this whole situation because he finally has someone that he can connect with and relate to and talk about this which is, you know, this big taboo thing in the wizarding world for some reason is to have to be part or full giant. And then Maxime is, yeah. like, too ashamed to accept that that's who she is. And that just made me feel so sad because Hagrid kind of just, like, puts himself on the line. And then she just, like, denies him trying to reach out and connect. And it oh, just broke my heart. Oh, absolutely. And, I mean, there's, like, so much vulnerability involved in, you know, him talking to her like that. And to, like, really reach out and be vulnerable and just be smacked down. And have it, like, reified that you were right in assuming that people are going to judge you for this. I mean, it's just, like, it's awful on so many levels. And then he, I mean, the additional level of he, him being romantically spurned, it's pretty awful. But it also just makes you love Hagrid all the more for, like, being willing to be vulnerable and put himself out there and yeah. hopeful. And But, yeah, it's not a great look on Maxime. I mean, I understand, right? She's like the head of a school. She's mm -hmm. afraid of being persecuted. Sure. In the wizarding world, this is a really like terrible position to be in. And so she doesn't want to admit to it. Yes. But I don't want to like judge her for that. But yeah, I think that it must just be so hard on poor Hagrid. And sucks that the boys overhear it. Yeah, the boys overhear it. And like Ron, Ron has like, I guess the standard wizard response where he's like, oh my gosh, this is horrible. It's like very reminiscent of the Lupin werewolf thing where they're like, oh, this is like, right. this is so bad. And then Harry actually is a great response where he's like, what? Nothing's wrong with Hagrid. Who cares? Like Hagrid or Harry has the perfect response to anything like this where he's just like, Hagrid's a cool person. Who cares if he's half giant, which is a great approach by Harry and I'm glad he handled it that way because it's the right approach I mean obviously this is like a parallel to to racism or sexism or whatever and Harry has the classic like let's just treat people as people and not worry about things that don't matter and I think it was a very nice thing for Harry to say surprisingly for once right he's like this innocent because he's new to the magical world he doesn't understand what prejudices he's supposed to have mm -hmm. and so we get to see him you know we get to see the world sort of as it should be without these huge preconceived judgments against each other it's like a really yeah it's a lovely attribute to harry his innocence yeah because you can't really get mad at ron because he probably only feels this way because he's been told his whole life since he grew up in such a a wizard heavy family that like giants are bad werewolves are bad 
And Harry does oh, bring that outside perspective where he's just like, why? Which is which is my perspective of reading it when at first they're making a big deal of Lupin being a werewolf. I'm like, why? That sounds awesome. <laughs> so right. it makes sense. No, the, I mean, Ron is taught about like his racism the way that we're all taught about our racism. Like, sure. It's up to him to start questioning it as he yeah. ages. And yeah, he's just, I mean, he's so far as a kid, he's still just a victim of his circumstance. Exactly. And so, especially with, yeah. with Hagrid, he's just so nice. And when Hagrid was describing his dad and his mom and his whole family situation, like, uh, Hagrid's dad sounds like the sweetest person. I know. I know. I used to pick him up and put him on the, the dresser when I got annoyed <laughs> at him. It's like this sweet little man. I mean, the idea in general, right, that we are the genes of our parents is obviously really disturbing, right? Like, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it gets confusing and like a interesting way where like the natures of different animals are obviously different like a lion is going to respond differently to a situation than a giraffe but yeah and I obviously don't know the makeups of giant but (laughs) yeah judging Hagrid just for himself he's like basically the best human being alive so he is he's so loyal he's so trusting and Hagrid really always does try to see the best in everyone like in this book, when when Rita starts saying bad things about Harry, he's like, why would anyone ever do that? And anytime anyone questions Dumbledore, he's like, Dumbledore is a great man. He's like very true to believing the best in everyone and then sticking to it and pretty much giving everyone the benefit of the doubt, which is just he's so nice and trusting and loyal. It's very admirable. I, I mean, like, I obviously completely agree. <laughs> I don't think he's just like motivated I don't know if it's gratitude or, but he's just like so present to the people around him and Mm -hmm. to taking care of animals. I mean, he's a caretaker, right? He's just, he's like the caretaker of Hogwarts. So I guess on that level, it makes sense. Yeah. Good old Hagrid. Yeah. There's also Fleur and Roger making out in the bushes, but not necessarily the most important element of the chapter. That's just like typical prom. I do feel bad for Roger. When they're picking the the mermaid challenge people, right. and she goes with her sister instead. In Fleur's defense, it's her sister who she loves. Exactly, that much. it's not like Crum or Cedric has anyone else to take. Like, it's not like Crum. Crum doesn't seem to be like very friendly or chum chum with all the other dudes at Durmstrang. Right. And they they don't really mention Cedric having anyone closer. So. I guess yeah. it makes sense. But it is funny. It, it's a funny... I never <laughs> thought of Roger feeling rejected by that. Being like, oh. <laughs> Does he ever come up later in the books, or is he just no. literally, like, forever known as... He's just the guy that made out with Fleur that one time? I think... So. I mean, if he does, it's, like, not in a big enough way that I really remember. Okay. So, I don't think so. <laughs> Poor guy. Well, I'll, I'll be looking out for him, because I do feel bad, but at the end of the day, he could probably still brag to his friends that he went to prom with the hottest girl in school. So. Oh, yeah. He's like 40 years old now <laughs> and fat and balding and is like, well, took the hottest girl in school to the Yule Ball. <laughs> oh, man. Well, this was fun. I'm glad we got to discuss the Yule Ball more Likewise. in detail. Glad we got to have you feature on the podcast. Would you like to give a little plug for Harry Potter and the Sacred Text? Because it's a lovely podcast. Oh, sure. We go through the books chapter by chapter, all 199 chapters, and treat the chapters as if they were sacred texts. So we read every chapter through a theme. It's me and my partner in crime, Casper Turkile, and our amazing mm-hmm. producer, Ariana Nettleman. And it's super fun. And you can find us in all of the regular places, the iTunes, the Stitcher, the website, you know, we're on the internet. So you can find us. All good things. Yeah. The live show that you guys did in Seattle was so much fun. I had a oh, blast. Thanks. So We did too. Where it's, it, yeah, it was good. Fun. Even down to the ad reads. The ad reads were like some of the funniest part. And that's how, that's the true success of a podcast is when the ad reads aren't like a, oh man, like I was almost crying laughing with the with the picture frame and the the wizard dating thing it was wonderful thank you we took a lot of time (laughs) writing those so i appreciate it and my friend chloe angel helped write Uh, those too so beautiful well they turned out lovely thank you oh man well thanks for being a part of this and I'll, i'll end the episode as we do always with the catchphrase of hogwarts that they say every day wizard on 
Powderless is created by Make Shubert. It is hosted by Make Shubert. It is edited by Make Shubert. It is produced by Make Shubert as well as Leanne Davis, Andres Ozelby, Aaron Johnson, Erica and Calvin Bauer, and Michael Vanderslice. And the music is by Bettina Campamanes. Thank you guys so much for listening. You can find us on your preferred podcasting app as well as social media, facebook.com slash Potterless. Twitter is at Potterless Pod and Instagram is Potterless Podcast. And if you want bonus content, you can head on over to patreon.com slash Potterless where your pledges get you access to my notes, director's commentary bonus episodes all sorts of fun stuff like that if that interests you great if not no big deal but anyway guys thank you so much for listening and until next time wizard on